Well, welcome, everybody. So listen, this is going to be an interactive session. We are going to be asking our panelists and all of you to tell us what actions you think could bend the emissions curve down and limit global warming to the Paris targets no more than 2 degrees and striving for 1.5. So how are we going to do that? We're going to use the interactive En-ROADS climate policy simulation model that our team, in partnership with the nonprofit Climate Interactive Think Tank, have developed over many, many years. So why are we going to do this? Why not just tell you about climate change? Well, first of all, many of you know a lot about climate change already. But even more importantly, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. So we're not going to do that. Instead, you all, our panelists and you, are going to have the opportunity to tell us what you would like to try. Before we get into that, here's the simulation right here. And what we uh, want you to know is, first of all, it's available in 20 different languages, and it's completely free. Anybody here, anybody in the world can access it, and you don't have to believe what I say. You can try whatever you like entirely on your own. And if you don't like the assumptions that we have made, which we believe are grounded in the best available peer-reviewed science from IPCC and other sources, you are free to change those assumptions for a wide range of the issues that are captured in the simulation. Let me tell you what we're going to do today as time is short. What you're seeing now is a very typical baseline scenario similar to what's widely used in integrated assessment climate modeling and by the IPCC, for example. So on the graph here, which I shall make bigger for you, what we see is total global primary energy consumption between the year 2000 and 2100 by source. So brown at the bottom, that's coal. Red is petroleum, blue is fossil gas, wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, all the zero carbon renewables represented separately in the simulation but added into the green wedge of zero carbon, bioenergy of all kinds up here, and nuclear power right here. We've worked carefully to make sure the model replicates the history of the system between 1990 and now, and then going forward, the assumptions are based on the UN's population projections. And let me just show you how the model works. If you think the population of the world is going to be bigger than the UN projects, 10.4 billion by 2100, just pull the slider. And as you do that, the model will instantly re-simulate and show you the results. So population is projected to grow by 2.4 billion more people between now and 2100. And the economies of the different parts of the world are projected to grow. This is GDP per capita for each major region of the world going forward <clears throat> to 2100. We also assume technological progress, which you can see here, a steady reduction in the amount of energy needed to produce goods and services in the economy, and a modest reduction of the carbon intensity of our energy system. However, what you see is growth in total energy use and growth in greenhouse gas emissions. So let's take a look at this graph right here. This shows total global greenhouse gas emissions. In green at the bottom, we have the emissions coming from deforestation, land degradation, all the sources from the natural environment. By far, the biggest chunk of the greenhouse emissions, as you know, comes from burning fossil fuels right here in gray, burning the coal, oil, and gas we're currently dependent on. Then we also have the fluorinated gases, CFCs, PFCs, et cetera, long-lived potent greenhouse gases, methane in light blue here, very potent greenhouse gas, and even more potent and long-lived than methane, nitrous oxide at the top. So greenhouse gases in this baseline continue to grow through 2100, much less than the economy, but they still continue to grow. And the consequence of that, let's take a look at some impacts. Global temperature is expected to rise under this scenario up to 3.3 C above pre-industrial levels by 2100 and still growing after that. Right here, under this scenario, we blast through the one and a half degree threshold by the end of this decade. 
and then we continue past the two degree threshold by around mid-century. This is unacceptable. This is nothing short of catastrophic for humanity. Let's take a look at why. Well, one reason is air pollution from burning all those fossil fuels. This is PM 2.5, which we know is killing millions of people prematurely all around the world, and it continues to grow. We can also look at, for example, crop yields. Crop yields for the big four grains that feed most people on the planet and the livestock that we eat, projected to fall up to 19% for corn, 16 for wheat, 8% for rice and soy as a result of climate change. This will be devastating in a world with 2.4 billion more people than we have today. In addition, Species around the world are going to be losing their ranges and many will be at risk of extinction in every animal and plant category on this planet. What else will be happening if this is allowed to occur? People are going to die at much higher rates from exposure to extreme heat. And you can see everywhere on the planet this is going to increase, but it's going to be increasing more in South and Southeast Asia, Southern Europe, South America, Africa, et cetera, not just in the developed countries, but also even in North America, Australia, Northern Europe, significant increases in deaths from exposure to extreme heat. And let's talk about sea level rise. In our scenario here, IPCC projection, 70 centimeters of sea level rise by 2100 and continuing to go up after that. What are the consequences of that? Well. This shows Northern Europe. This is what happens with that amount of sea level rise. Devastation on the coast of European countries and in England. Let's take a look at the Gulf Coast of the United States. This is New Orleans right here, Houston right here. Devastation, and this is optimistic. We get significant hurricanes in this region. Katrina had a five meter storm surge Let's just take a look at a four meter storm surge. This will be devastating to the energy industry, to critical infrastructure for the United States, to the people who live in this region. And then let's take a look at Shanghai. This is Shanghai after a typhoon, total devastation. You're welcome when you try the model to look at any coastal region in the world you like and explore how it might affect you. But the key point is, it doesn't matter where you live. You could live in Tibet, it's still going to affect you. If there's nuclear confrontation between, say, India and Pakistan over displacement of refugees by climate change on the Indus Delta, that affects you no matter where you live. So one other impact, let's take a look. What, is all of, what do all of these harms do to our economy? Well, let's take a look at GDP. This graph here shows you global GDP, the total gross world product for every country in the planet. The dashed line shows what the GDP would be if climate had no impact on the economy, which we know is wrong. It's already hurting us today. This line shows how much we lose as a result of the climate change we've just showed you. And in my view, this is over-optimistic but based on the peer-reviewed research. Take a look at this. It may not look like much to you on this graph, but compare it to right here. That drop right there, that is the economic impact of COVID. I lost friends in the pandemic, no doubt some of you did as well, and we all know the economic harm that it caused. But compared to what's coming from climate change, I'm sorry to say COVID is a mere blip. So that's where we're headed, folks, 3.3 and catastrophe for humanity. And I know I'm putting my reputation as a scientist on the line when I say that, but there's no other word for it. The UN says, in their typical anodyne way, severe and irreversible consequences with limited ability to adapt. Well, that's scientists speak for catastrophe. So what are we going to do to get away from that outcome? What we're going to do is ask our panel and then ask you what we can do. So at the bottom, we've got all these actions and policy levers. And let me turn it back to Crystal 
so we can see what our panel says. Thank you for that great introduction to the simulator, John. I'd like to start with Catherine and tell us a little bit about your work in energy and to combat climate change and what action you think would be uh, of a significant impact for the climate and in time. All right, um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, super excited uh, to be here and, and really congratulations for, for this simulator because I think it's, it's a very nice way to show the multi-parameters equation we're trying to solve and in a very compelling, very, very compelling way indeed. So thank you for that. Uh, energy contributes roughly two thirds to the emissions, global emissions of the world. So that left hand side of your panel here is really, really, really important. It has a very big impact and we have to make sure that we take all the actions to decarbonize the energy system. At Engie, this is what we are here to do. Uh, we are producing electricity, we are producing uh, green gas, and we are also a midstreamer, so we transport gas. We have this vision of a decarbonized energy mix, which will combine electrons and molecules, but in a decarbonized manner. Electrons from renewable power and gas from green gas, whether it's a biomethane, hydrogen, and derivative of hydrogen. When I look at your left-hand side, we have to get rid of coal. Coal today can be removed from the energy supply in a way that will maintain the energy, both uh, emissions, uh, to, to drastically drop the energy emissions, but also to keep the energy supply affordability. Because I think one thing that is really, really important, you mentioned very, very hard, we have to get this climate change under control. We have to get below the two degrees. We also have to find the narrow path of affordability, acceptability, to make sure we don't have this social backlash that we all feel in our societies, sometimes ready to go back. So affordability is very important. But with the technology today, I can with confidence say, and we see that at NG, where we only have now 2% of our energy produced from coal, so we are on this journey to reduce coal, and I would put this challenge out that we have to get rid of coal globally, so let's put this uh, cursor let's there on the left okay. hand side, let's test that. Thank you. And, and that, I, I believe this will have a, a big, big positive okay. impact. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Catherine. So let's simulate her idea. So over here, what we can do is we can reduce the construction of new coal infrastructure. And as you probably know, China and other countries in East Asia particularly have a significant amount of coal generation capacity and the supply chains to supply it on the books, permitted and under construction. So as in Glasgow, let's simply cut back construction, phase down, phase out all new coal capacity. We were at 3.3 above pre-industrial, and if we phase out the coal globally, that takes off three tenths of a degree. Every tenth of a degree matters, so that's a fantastic impact. Thank you very much. All right, and um, actually, I think we have time if Catherine wants to suggest one more Sure, one more what action. would you like to do Is there next something else then? you'd like to try? <laughs> Okay, so I would have done much more on coal, by the way. Not Great. Just oh, okay. Infrastructure. We can do that. We can would, do that. I would do much more on coal. Reduction in coal utilization, uh, obviously. So yeah. let's do that. Let's be more ambitious because the technology is here, is ready. We Great. can get rid of coal. So we can do that. We can simulate that idea as well. So what we've done so far is stop building new coal infrastructure. And it matters. It's very important. Now what we can also do is we can reduce the utilization of the existing capacity. What that means is existing coal plants would have to be shut down gradually, but starting now. And as we do that, we can get another tenth of a degree. That's pretty aggressive. This is pretty aggressive, right? And it's going to take a lot of action to get it done. But it makes a big difference. OK, so that's where we have other ideas, which is to massively accelerate the deployment of renewables. OK. okay. This technology is ready. It's mature. Uh, renewable energies is fairly low cost. It's affordable. It's very decarbonized. And to, to, 
to make sure that this coal uh, stoppage is realistic, you have to replace it with something, right. hence, you know, massively developed renewables. So you'll right. notice that Let's by taking that. the coal out of the system, look at the green wedge in our base case, and let's compare that to now. The green wedge has already expanded. This is because as the coal goes down, energy prices go up. That makes renewables even more attractive, but not as fast as you would like. So your last idea before we move on to Antoine and Zaya, let's subsidize and promote, incentivize even faster deployment of renewables. And as we do that, there's another tenth of a degree. We're down to 2.8. Fantastic. And before I pass it to Antoine, I just want to introduce him myself because oh. <laughs> it is his policies that will enable this acceleration of the renewables. Good, Excellent. Antoine. <laughs> Thank you so much. So the same question to you, Antoine. Based on your work to combat climate change, what solution do you see as being something that's going to get us there and it's going to get us there in time? Good morning. Thank you so much for this tool because I think it is very useful. So as Catherine said, we are trying to also to build these policies in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we have the same issue that there are so many triggers. So we have to illustrate them and to make people understand and play with it. So this is really a very, very nice tool. So thank you so much for that. So in the French government, I, I would like to have this kind of tool in France, <laughs> not only okay. for the world. So we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk after that. <laughs> uh, so I think that Catherine is totally right when she says that the, one of the most important issues is energy production and fossil fuel reduction. So maybe the first idea was, would be also to reduce massively oil consumption in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that I have two more than after, but let's try first yeah, let's start. how let's to start reduce oil so, emissions. So, so my question to you, Antoine, is how would you implement a policy to reduce the consumption of oil? That was my point, because I think that when you just you are just on the left hand side of, the, of this table. Uh, I think you, are, you, you do not see all the actions, concrete actions that you have to do in order to reduce that. It will be in transport, for example, it is one of the most uh, important things in oil consumptions, and also part of it in France, in buildings and industry. Great. So, Great. all right. Excellent. So, I think what you're suggesting, don't let me put words in your mouth, is let's improve the efficiency of the energy use in our buildings, our industrial processes, our transportation infrastructure, and so we can simulate that. Let's start with improving the energy efficiency of the entire transport system. Land-based transportation, transportation, waterborne, and aviation. And as we do that, there's another tenth of a degree. And if we do the same in the built environment, so residential and commercial buildings, industrial processes, there's another two-tenths of a degree. That's really helpful. And you'll notice that it reduces the use of the fossil fuels quite a bit. Now, there's still a lot of petroleum and fossil gas in the energy mix. It's much less than before. You can compare that here but there's still a substantial amount. But 2.5, this is amazing progress. So that's huge. Yeah. But maybe in redu reducing also uh, production of electricity with oil, you can do a little bit better maybe. So how would you raise the price of oil so as to make oil less attractive and encourage the substitutes of green energy sources? This is something difficult in France, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but my answer will be a little bit different than the one you want me to say, is that helping people to, to make electrification faster. Great. And I know that it is a kind of a debate with Catherine, so I, I put it on the table. Great. So uh, let's look at electrification. There's already electrification of transport and the built environment occurring now, but let's see if we can accelerate that. That would take incentives for people to purchase electric vehicles for personal use, for trucking, long distance, short haul, for rail, et cetera. Let's electrify the transport system. And there's another tenth of a degree. And let's see, there it goes. So this is a significant acceleration in the market share of new transportation infrastructure. One thing you'll see is although under this set of policies we have here, electrification grows very rapidly, but that's the share of new transportation sales, so new cars, for example. 
the installed base lags significantly behind. In the United States, there are 260 million light-duty vehicles, cars, SUVs, and trucks on the road today. Only about 2 million of those are electric. Cars last a long time, so you can increase the market share, but you still have to do something about all those existing vehicles. That's why this lags behind. But this is another tenth of a degree. Every tenth of a degree matters. Now, what if we also electrify the built environment? And, well, it didn't exactly notch over a full degree, but let's see. We can have a little more detail here. 2.45 and now 2.37. So almost another tenth of a degree. This is excellent, terrific progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'd like to turn to Zaya. So same question to you based on your work as an, an activist, a climate yes. activist. What do you think would be a, a high leverage solution that would help to get us there in time? Yeah, one of the solutions is um, planting trees, the solutions, um, but also giving the power to indigenous people be in the decision makers, you know, and also teaching people here from the society to combine ecological knowledge with the technology. And like this, we can all to work together. And also like, everyone here getting to know more what indigenous people can proportion, you know, for educating us and how to act and combating um, against the climate change. Wait, so I'm hearing you want to try uh, both, it sounded like afforestation, planting trees, and, and deforestation. Yeah. Okay, which, do, Zaya, which, which would you, you like to try first? Reducing deforestation or restoring with planting new trees. Yeah, yeah, reducing deforestation for sure. Great. So you'll notice that the policies we've tried so far are working primarily on the energy system, which is absolutely essential. But we're still at 2.4, and here you have a significant amount of deforestation still going on. If I go over here, I can show you the amount of deforestation. It's down a little bit already from these policies, and that's as a result of reduced land degradation and the need for, uh, with a lower global temperature, crop yields are higher than they would have been. And so you don't need to clear as many forests to grow the food we need for our expanding population. So there's already a small reduction in deforestation just by avoiding the global warming by reducing the fossil fuels. That's a very important feedback that everybody should notice. But we need to do more. So let's reduce deforestation further. As called for in the Glasgow and reinforced at Sharm el Sheikh. And here we've reduced deforestation not to zero because that doesn't seem quite realistic, yeah, but very, very substantially compared to where we're going now. And that's getting us another tenth of a degree. So fantastic. So let me turn it back to you, Zaya. What yes. would you like to try next? Um, I think planting trees. OK. Yeah. So I think if everyone plants a tree, it's, we're going to come back to a native forest and not a second forest as is in the Amazon rainforest. Great. So down here we have afforestation. This is planting trees on previously degraded, deforested land. And if you've heard of the Trillion Tree Campaign, this would be how you would simulate that. So why don't we just go for it and plant a trillion trees? Boom. 2.1. Now let's take a look and see whether it really is doing everything that we might hope. So right here, this is how much CO2 those new trees are removing from the atmosphere. It's quite a lot, almost 5 billion tons per year. That's about 8% of today's total global emissions. But we don't get there until the last part of the century. So Antoine, I'm a professor. I'm going to call on the students. I'm sorry. But uh, why does it take so long? to get the big impact. <laughs> you didn't know we were going to do this to you, so. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, but I, I have one question about that, because one interesting thing is that in order to decrease, uh, for example, oil, 
we need a suit to replace. I think that we haven't spoke enough about a decrease of consumption in a way. So we have to, to do that afterwards. Yeah. And with forest, there is something about bioenergy also that we have to, and this balance we have to, to find in between afforestation and reducing also old because we replace by something else. So bioenergy is something interesting to test, I would say. Great. But so you, I, I'm still going to be the professor here. You didn't really answer the question. <laughs> Why does it take so long to see the big removal here? You know, we're here. We know we have to cut emissions by roughly to net zero by 2050. That's right here. That's only about halfway to the contribution of the, the afforestation, the new because, trees. Because trees need time to Exactly. Grow. It just <laughs> takes so long for the trees to grow. When you plant a sapling, it's this big, has almost no leaf, and it doesn't take up much carbon. And depending on the species and the climate zone, it can take 100 years for those trees to mature to the point where they can remove a lot of carbon. And there's another problem here, which is how much land do we need to do this? Yes. And we need a lot of land. This dashed line right there, that is the total land area of India. We would need more than twice that much to plant a trillion trees. So I don't think that's really quite realistic. Now, I love trees. I spend as much time in the forest as I possibly can. We should plant trees wherever it's appropriate. And natural forests, not plantations. Plantations are monocultures, and they're highly vulnerable to disease and pests. So we don't want to get in a situation like that. Natural forests take longer to grow, but they're far better for biodiversity. They're far better for soil preservation. They're far better for indigenous peoples everywhere in the world. So we'll cut that back a little bit. We're at 2.2 degrees. So terrific. And what's next? You want to turn it over to the audience and see yeah, what so they thought we should do? Let me just say, this is fantastic progress, right? 2.2, we started at 3.3, but we're not, we're not where we need to go yet. So we asked you at the beginning to point your phone at that QR code, and let's see what the results are. So if you didn't do it, go ahead and point your phone at this QR code right now. You can change your vote if you already started. If you, if you want to change your vote based on what you've seen so far, go ahead. I'll give you a minute or two to do that. <laughs> and then I'm going to show you the results. And we'll see what you all think we ought to be doing in alignment with or in addition to what you've seen so far. Remember, two degrees, striving for 1.5. So you can do this anonymously. How are we doing? I see some phones up still. <laughs> Maybe uh, give you just a couple more seconds. Let me just say, while we're doing this, this was a fantastic set of great suggestions, and they have high leverage. We've made a lot of progress. OK, are we ready? Let's see. There we go. Phasing out coal, oil, and gas, phasing out the fossil fuels, by far the number one suggestion. Renewables, nuclear, we haven't looked at nuclear yet. Not much support in this room for fusion, but I got to tell you, I'm sure, Catherine, you attend many meetings where people say this is the wave of the future. And as you all know, right here in France, we have the ITER project under construction for I don't know how many years now, with I don't know how many more decades to go. Oh, no. Well, we'll see. Um, and MIT is working on this, too. Pricing carbon pollution is the number two selection here. Improving energy efficiency, electrify everything, good. And reducing the other greenhouse gases comes in pretty strong as well. So let's now go back and see what happens. So we've already done an awful lot of the things that were suggested. The number two suggestion, I believe, was pricing carbon pollution. And we haven't done that yet. And you avoided it in your comments, which is OK. You can make whatever comments you want. Catherine, did you want to? Yeah. yeah. In fact, I was going to push for carbon price. Oh. I right. think that's a very good one. I think it's important that we also send the right signal today of the price of what will come later. It's not easy, but a fairly straightforward way to do that is to have the right CO2 price. So please. Uh, Fantastic. Like, yeah. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the base case. This is the base case. And so energy on the left, greenhouse gases on the right. Let's implement a carbon price 
just alone to see what impact it would have. Can you give me, Catherine, an idea of what carbon price you think would be needed? Minimum 100. $100 per ton of carbon Minimum. dioxide, which is very close to the price in the European trading system today. So let's do that. So we're at 3.3 in the base case. There's an average price of $5 today around the world. Let's increase that globally to $100 a ton. Just that action alone gets us to 2.7 degrees. Yeah, let's hear it for carbon pricing. <laughs> so, and look at the benefits. It squeezes out a lot of coal. It squeezes out oil. It squeezes out gas. It increases the renewables. It even increases nuclear somewhat, I believe. Yep, a little bit. Um, and it also reduces total energy demand because everybody has a big incentive to become more efficient. In our scenario over here, we did it by phasing out coal, energy efficiency, and electrification. And we can add that here, too. So why don't we um, do that? But let me ask you all a hard question. Many people believe, and with good reason, that if we just put a price on carbon, it's going to be very harmful to the poor, to the low-income people, to the disadvantaged, to the historically colonized and abused peoples in every country of the world, not just the developing world, but even here in France and in the United States. How could we solve that problem? How could we keep the benefits of a carbon price, huge high leverage policy, and do it in a way that doesn't harm the poor? Zaya? Zaya, yeah. yeah. I think changing the system where people start to believe that we need to bring back the balance where now we are in disbalance. We don't have a long time for a prosper future in less than 10 years. So we need to change the system where we go in re-education. Re-education yourself and your next generation, your children, and everyone that believes the future can be possible now. And changing, not taking too much resources from the planet. Re-education and industries. Industries to do in a very reasonable way. I impact now that doesn't, you know, go in a bad way as we are living today. The pandemic was just one thing, but can come Great. much more effects after. So I think... Other, so that's fa I totally agree. Other thoughts, Catherine? How can we help the poor and keep the benefits for the climate from a carbon price? So uh, it's, it's a huge issue because, again, uh, nothing works here if there is no social acceptability of these measures. So it has to be put in the center of your model. Not easy, because trying to model social acceptability is indeed very, very difficult. I think where we need to strike the right balance is indeed the signal prices that the CO2 price will trigger. Therefore, the most polluting stuff will be more expensive than the least polluting stuff. That's what we mean by CO2 price. We have to couple that with, indeed, a system where the less favored people, the most vulnerable people, get subsidies or get help to transition. Right. To transition from pollution to less polluting system. So subsidies for the transition. It's important because right. at the end, it's not sustainable. Yeah. So you need to, f you know, to find a way to subsidize the transition for those people who are the most vulnerable. And one could argue the people who can afford big cars, for example, very polluting, well, maybe we don't need to help these people, right? Or, or they should pay and not get any subsidy. C correct. Exactly. So, but that's obviously, that is how it should work. And maybe Antoine can, can translate that into policy work. Words. The first one is, I totally agree with that, but we have two facts that are very important, I think. The first one is the one you said uh, with cars, electrification of cars, because there is a very big difference in between the stock every, and, and what change every year. And physically speaking, many things take time to happen. So we have, and for example, in France, we have 2 million new cars per year and 33 million cars uh, the total. So it takes time to, to replace and, or to decrease that. And we need to, 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 in, to integrate that fact. It is very important. So when you just uh, switch on carbon price, you have one year only two million people that can decrease, uh, uh, avoid it, yeah. and the other one that takes that. That's a so very huge issue, and this, the last one is uh, 
the, the one of financing everything because when you need you say that you need subsidies to a company yes it's true but it's huge amounts of money so it needs to be to find a solution on that so this is a great set of suggestions let's see if we can bring some of that into the simulation so we can bring back into the simulation electrification of transport buildings and industry energy efficiency, which is already being encouraged by the carbon price, but it doesn't solve all problems, right? If you live in an apartment and you pay the energy bill, your building owner has no incentive to upgrade the efficiency of the heating system or give you better windows because they would pay for it and you get the benefits. So that's a market failure. This is something we can solve but it's not going to be solved by itself just having a carbon price. So I've added energy efficiency policies back in as we had over here. Also, the subsidies for renewables, which would go primarily to the developing world, technology transfer, the funding for it. This would be part of the loss and damage fund that was established last year in Sharm el-Sheikh. And we also want to continue to reduce deforestation and promote afforestation and now we're down to 2.1. But now the key question is, what about equity and fairness for low-income and disadvantaged people who would be paying a little bit more for energy as a result of the carbon price? So there's two critical points about this I want everybody to understand. First of all, when the carbon price is implemented and it starts to work, look at how much the petroleum wedge, the coal wedge, the gas wedge, look at how much they've dropped. What happens to the price of oil when the demand for oil and gas and coal falls that much? What happens to their prices? They go down. So who's going to pay a lot of the carbon price? Not you, not citizens, the oil producers, the big oil companies, the coal producers, the frackers. That is why they hate the idea of a carbon price and are opposing it with every ounce of lobbying on K Street and in Brussels they can manage. Yeah, go, you know, you're going to have to fight for this because the opposition is very powerful and very sophisticated. So first of all, poor people around the world are not going to pay the entire carbon price. The producers of the fossil fuels will. But some of it will still be falling on the backs of the citizens. So what do you do about that? I think the best solution I've ever heard, and it's entirely in line with what Catherine and Antoine and Zaya have said, is you give the revenue back to the people as a carbon dividend. This is actually already being done in British Columbia, for example. So what would that mean? It would mean every month you would get a direct deposit to your bank account. And if you don't have a bank account, if you're unbanked, you would get a debit card or you'd go to an office and you'd get cash. And that would be your share of all the revenue raised by the carbon price. It's many trillions of dollars globally every year. It's a lot of money. And the key point that you made, Catherine, is the affluent people like us, and that includes me, we would pay more. Our carbon footprints are big. We would pay more than our carbon dividend. But Everywhere in the world, in Europe, in North America, in Africa, in South Asia, in China, the bottom half of the income distribution, their carbon footprints are small. They would get more in their carbon dividend than the extra costs they would pay. They would be economically better off. This would be a huge transfer of resources from those who have benefited from fossil fuels to those who contributed the least to the climate problem. And I think it would go a long way towards addressing the fairness, equity, and loss and damage issue that is so difficult today. I and mean, just to make this very clear in France, imagine if instead of simply raising the price of gasoline, petrol, your president had implemented a carbon dividend policy. I think then we would have not had the yellow vests in the streets protesting against that. We would have had more people in the streets demanding an even higher price on petrol so they can get an even bigger carbon dividend check every month. You should try this. But maybe two words. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I would say is that um, 
if you just you have to go into details for that to be to be precise. First of all, uh, the amount, the increase of the amount that we put on uh, subsidizing people in order to to accompany this transition has steeply increased uh, in the amount that is comparable to the one we earn by uh, carbon tax. Because my second point, and it is important, is that you need a very huge carbon tax if you want to be able to pay the real amount of subsidies you need to really accompany people. And if you look at these figures, it doesn't really match. So it's, the, the carbon tax dividend is only a small part of what you really need in order to, to invest and to make this transition happen. So this is something a little bit tricky, but uh, there is no very uh, uh, good solution for that. So it helps. And of course, yes, we have to, to put all the, the revenues into uh, helping poor people to do this transition, but it is not enough to succeed. That's right. And the extra money would come from the self-interest of the developed countries. You know, people talk about, well, why, you know, we, we, we created the loss and damage fund in Sharm el-Sheikh, and that's a big step forward, but it doesn't have any significant money allocated to it yet. And many people in my country and other developed countries say, well, look, why should we give aid, foreign aid, it's charity, to these people in the less developed countries when we have needs in our own economy? This is the wrong way to think about it. It's in the interests of everyone, including everybody living in affluent countries, to do this because of the harms that are coming if we don't. Imagine the migration from climate refugees who are hungry, who are flooded out, where are those people going to go? They're going to come to your country. They're going to come to my country. They're going to come to all the more affluent places in the world. It is in our interest to help them build a sustainable, prosperous, healthy life in their own countries so that they can have the same opportunities that we enjoy here. So it is not aid, charity. It's self-interest. I, I can't imagine a greater alignment of interests, actually. But you're absolutely right. Okay, now back to the story. We're at 2.1 here with a carbon price, with renewables, efficiency, electrification everywhere, deforestation reduction, afforestation. We can still phase out the coal. Let's phase out the coal even faster than the carbon price will do it. And we can do that right here. That's helping. And we can take some of the existing plants out of production. 2.1, we're not where we need to go. Let's go back here and see what people said we should do. And it should come up, I hope. There it is. There was another big opportunity here. Well, nuclear, we've already subsidized renewables. Nuclear is a big choice. And then we have reducing other greenhouse gases. So let's take a look at that. So here's the scenario we're building. Let's see if nuclear makes any difference. So we're at 2.1. How much nuclear do we have? Almost no change, and then it actually falls below what it is today by the end. Why is that? That's because renewables get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The more you build them, the cheaper they get through learning and scale economies, and they simply outcompete the nuclear by the end of the century. But what happens if we subsidize nuclear power? I hear all the time that this is the answer for climate change. 2.1. Seven cents per kilowatt hour subsidy for nuclear, that is huge. That is a huge subsidy. And we do get more nuclear. It made no difference to the climate at all. No difference. So why is that? Well, there it is, more nuclear. But what happens, let me take it away. Look over here, let me make this bigger. Look over here at how big the green wedge is, and now, if we s heavily subsidize nuclear, what happened to the green wedge? Let's go back and forth here. No nuclear, nuclear. No nuclear, nuclear. What's happening? We build more nuclear plants. What are we not building? We're not building as many renewables. Thank you. And that's because, look, if I give you, as an electric utility, a huge subsidy to build more nukes, you will. But then you're not going to build as many utility-scale solar plants and offshore wind farms. And so you're taking more 
almost zero carbon from nuclear and less from the renewables. No real benefit. And nuclear is a lot more expensive today than those renewables, including storage. John, we have about two minutes to get under two degrees. OK, so I'm going to take the nuclear out. What else did people ask for? What they asked for was reducing the non-CO2 contributors to climate change. So 6% of you wanted to do that. We've already done phasing out the fossils, pricing carbon, renewables. Nuclear doesn't help. So let's look at reducing the other greenhouse gases. So coming back here, this is the methane right here in blue, the fluorinated gases there in yellow, and the nitrous oxide. Well, let's reduce those. Guess what? 1.7 degrees. How does that help? These are very powerful greenhouse gases. We need to reduce those emissions. Methane comes somewhat from agriculture. This means better agricultural practices, no-till agriculture. It means capturing the, the waste, the manure, and using it to make biogas and powering our farm equipment with that. It also means reducing the fugitive emissions of methane from the energy supply system. That means reducing the production of oil and gas. And that's already happening to a large extent from the carbon price, but we have to do even more. So there we go. Also reducing the nitrous oxide, very important, and fully implementing the Kigali Amendment on the fluorinated gases. This gets us to 1.7. So wait a minute, what have we done here? We have got a much safer world. Every single action that you see here can be done right now with today's technologies. And then those technologies get better and cheaper through the normal course of scaling up and learning by doing. We don't need any magical technological breakthroughs like fusion power. We don't need speculative schemes like direct air capture. We're able to get under two degrees with what we have at hand today. That's really important. I think you all need to give yourselves a round of applause for getting there. And let's take a look. Let's just take a look in the 30 seconds I've got left. How much does it help us create a safer world? Ocean acidification stops and even slowly begins to recover. Crop yields, they're still going to go down but not nearly as much as where we're headed to. This reduces hunger in the world, reduces civil conflict, international conflict. Fantastic. Species will be safer. Now, th let's be clear. Two degrees, 1.7, even 1.5 is not safe. It's just safer by far than where we're going. Every tenth of a degree matters. Every tenth of a degree matters. And in terms of our prosperity and our health, Air pollution, way down, saves a lot of lives, improves people's health, boosts labor productivity. What else is happening here? Deaths from extreme heat, still going to go up, but much, much less. Gives us a chance to provide the air conditioning and the safety net that people are going to need. And finally, let's take a look at the economy. The economy is going to grow better and stronger and more equitably around the world just by reducing all that warming down to 1.7. It doesn't make a safe world, but by goodness, it is a much safer world. It is the world you want to live in. It is the world you want your children to live in. It is the world you want every child to live in. We can do it. Crystal, you, back John. to you. Thank you so much. I feel much safer right now. <laughs> so I'd like to turn back to the panel one last time and just give you an opportunity to share any final reflections from this experience, from any insights that you had during this experience, and anything you really would like to just emphasize about what we need to do to combat the climate challenge. Uh, Zaya, would you like to start first? You know, I think it's extremely important, all the reducers and the carbon emissions and everything. But also, it's like what we can do all together to accelerate these reducers to go forward and impact 
because of where we are right now has not any way to come back. And we really need to act in the way that the professor say, that if we all do together, that as Catherine and Antoine were saying too. So I, I think that deforestation is a huge thing that also we need to think that I thought that was very little percent that, that people vote. And it's very important that we have also nature involved for the future and not just think about all the industries that can be reduced, but also in nature too. So thank you so much for being here. Catherine, would you like to go? Just, uh, it can be done. It must be done. It's much more complex than just playing with cursors, which means we're going to need every effort. Like, yeah, you said it. And I think this panel is a nice representation of some of the people and actor types that need to be involved, government, policymakers, ONG, uh, NGOs, representatives, and of course, business sectors. I think we could have had the finance uh, sector also represented. And I think, so a lot of people need to get involved. And I would maybe add, uh, as a last comment, the importance of having the local stakeholders' involvement. A lot of these initiatives, a lot of these solutions will come from the local and from our people, from societies. So it's a very different model that we need to put in place. It cannot be just top-down driven. There has to be a bit of top-down, but then a lot, a lot of bottoms up, which can in turn be a fantastic, positive momentum, which I think here the, the conference is, is trying to encapsulate this very positive momentum. We have to embark everybody to make all these small cursors move the way we want. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. Antoine? Yeah. So we spoke about a lot about climate, and I think that you, you told it, Zaya, but nature and biodiversity in the world are as important as climate and this very important change we have to do. And this is something I want to underline because it's crucial. It goes some way uh, together, sometimes not totally aligned, so we have to work on that. And beyond nature and biodiversity, we have also this huge so, um, issue of uh, resources. You spoke about a little bit about land use, for example. You spoke about uh, water, uh, all that, uh, biomass, so forest and so far. And when you go into details, so you know that by her, <laughs> but to, we need to, 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 to do this, all these policies, policies, considering the need to preserve these resources. And it's uh, a very big constraint uh, in all that. So you mentioned uh, nuclear versus renewable, for example. The only, I would say, um, advantage of that is land use, occup land occupation. Maybe energy density is higher with the nuclear. So when we are not able to do as many uh, renewables we, can, we want to do, because it's difficult for many reasons, we have to find this balance. So, and everything is balanced in a way. We, we have to act uh, with very determination, but with balance also. So justice is, a, is, a, is obviously a, in the center of that. And I think that your, your tool shows that there is not only one solution, so we have to play with every solution, every actions. And as Catherine said, we have to do it together, so uh, citizens, companies, and so far. So this kind of tool helps a lot, and uh, yeah. we'll discuss later on, on friends. Absolutely. So thank you all very much for these wonderful comments. Let me make a few final observations building off these wise remarks that we've just heard. First of all, Catherine, you are absolutely right. It is easy to pull the sliders in a simulation like this. To make this happen, every single person here is going to have to get up and take action and fight like hell because the fossil fuel industries are opposing what we know we need to do. You're going to have to get up and fight. You need to get active and you need to take it to your friends. You need to take it to your colleagues. You need to learn how to do what I just did here with you for yourself and bring this tool everywhere in the world. There's all about 650, more than 650 people in 150 countries now who have learned how to do this for themselves. The tool is completely free. And on June 1st, we're releasing this new version here that you just got a preview for to the entire world. 
on the day before, May 31st, we're running three webinars where you can see what's going on, sign up for the free trainings, and learn how to do this yourself. Over 280,000 people around the world that we know of have participated in a workshop with this tool, including I have personally briefed dozens and dozens, possibly over 1,000 C-suite CEO and board level corporate leaders, leaders in civil society, over 37 senators in the United States, over 100 members of the House of Representatives in the United States, four members of the president's cabinet, multiple governors, mayors, city councils, and their counterparts in other countries around the world. You can do that too. That's how we're going to get progress. No model, no simulation is perfect. That's not the point. The point is to show what has high leverage, what has low leverage. Nothing is sadder than for people like you to commit themselves, their energy, their passion to a solution that can't matter. So focus on what's high leverage. And we've just seen what those can be. Pricing carbon and giving the revenue back to the people. Promoting renewables, phasing out the coal. Energy efficiency. Underrated, energy efficiency is the fastest, safest, cheapest way to get us what we want. Never forget, in the powerful words of my, words of my friend Amory Lovins, nobody wants a ton of coal, a barrel of oil, or a cubic meter of gas. Nobody wants that. What we want, what we need, what we deserve is to be warm in the winter, cool in the summer, have light when we need it, and have access to decent, good jobs, education, health care, cultural opportunities, and all the other privileges that everybody in this room enjoys. That's what we want. Efficiency is the fastest, safest, cheapest way to, way to get it. And so we're all going to need to work on those things that are not getting enough attention now. And that means not only being an activist, it means walking your talk. So just for example, although I'm wearing a suit right now, I've always been a bicycle commuter. I ride 19 kilometers each way to my job every time I go in. I compost my food waste. I don't have a second home. I try to be happy where I am. And a few years ago, my wife and I did a deep energy retrofit on our house. What that means is we did a renovation with much more insulation than building codes require, much better quality windows than building codes require, tightening the building envelope so it doesn't leak the air to the outside, high efficiency appliances, LED lighting everywhere. We completely eliminated the natural gas that was heating and providing hot water and replaced that with heat pumps and we put solar on our roof. Over the past eight years, we have made 40% more energy than we use with zero fossil fuels. So my house is now a power plant producing 100% green energy for everybody else in my neighborhood to use. And that includes now powering two electric vehicles. You can do this too. You can help the poor and the low income people in your communities do that too and advocate for the policies that will let everybody everywhere enjoy the same advantages that we have. So let me just wrap up by saying thank you to our panelists. Thank and you by, so much. And by encouraging all of you, encouraging all of you to join us later in this wonderful event. We are going to be at a booth over here where we'll be demonstrating the En-ROADS model. We're also going to be doing this event again on Saturday afternoon. So come back again. Tell your friends who didn't make it here. It's standing room only. Come back and tell them to join us on Saturday up in the Eiffel stage down there on the second floor. And most importantly, Get busy. We can do this. But it's going to require everybody. Nobody is going to do this for us. It's all on us. We can do it. Let's get busy. It isn't going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much.